Amen. All right. Judges chapter 1. I'm super excited to start the book of Judges. I love the book of Judges. There's a lot of great um, stories in the Bible that are very valuable to us, as you know, most stories in the Bible are. But the book of Judges, so where, where are we at thinking about the book of Judges as we start? You know, where are we at in history uh, of the Bible here? So this Judges comes right after Joshua. So basically where we're at in the history of the Bible of the Old Testament is the children of Israel have come into the promised land. They, of course, were, they were, come out of, they were brought out of Egypt by, by Moses. They spent 40 years uh, wandering in the wilderness, and then they came across the Jordan River to settle the land and to drive out the Canaanites and many other uh, tribes that were there. And Joshua, the book of Joshua, is mainly you know, Joshua fighting to take over the land of the promised land. And Joshua has just died here in Judges chapter 1. And, you know, we're in the time about, if you could think about um, dates, we're about 300 years before the first king of Israel, King Saul. If you want to think about it from just a timeline, it's about 1350 B.C. or so. As Of course, B.C., you know, it counts down. So as you go forward in time in the Old Testament, you know, the dates will get smaller and smaller, not larger as they do with us today. But look, we're about 300, 350 years before King David or so, and we're talking about um, there's no judges yet in Judges chapter 1. You say it's judges, but I don't see a judge because basically, you know, they're still finishing up the conquest of the promised land here. You see a lot of fighting in Judges chapter 1 so far. And, you know, Joshua's dead. And as a matter of fact, they're actually losing some territory, you can see in Judges chapter 1. So, jo you know, that's the scene that we're at with Judges and starting out the book of Judges. So let's just go ahead and step through Judges chapter 1 and see what we can learn from this chapter in the Bible. The Bible says in Judges chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? So obviously there's still land to take. There's still fighting to be done. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. Turn to Genesis chapter 49. I just want to show you a couple things about Simeon. And if you look at a map of... Um, Simeon is kind of unique. If you ever look at a, a historical map of where the 12 tribes of Israel settled, Simeon is the only one that really doesn't have... Um, his own area cut out. He's actually inside the nation of Judah or the territory that Judah has. So he's kind of, I, he's not really sharing it, but he has land that's inside the borders of Judah. It's kind of a unique situation. Look at Genesis 49 and verse number 8, and we can see why that is. And the Bible says in Genesis 49, 8, it says, Judah... Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemy. So this is Judah. This is, uh, you know, the one that is going to, you know, fight the Canaanites right now and ask Simeon to go with him. He's like, thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? So he's saying Judah's going to be very powerful. So that makes sense why when the children of Israel said, who should go up? You know, God said Judah goes first. It matches here. Look back at verses 5, um, at verse number 5 of the same chapter, and we'll see um, what the Bible says about Simeon. So this is their father giving them blessings, and he's talking about what's going to happen to these 12 um, to these 12 sons, the Bible says, Simeon and Levi are brethren, they're brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come thou not into their secret, unto their assembly. This is Jacob, of course, talking to, um, or Israel, talking to his 12 sons. But he says, Simeon and Levi, they are they're instruments of cruelty. He says, O my soul, come not, not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, be not, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So this explains why Simeon was not given his own section of the area. And, you know, as a matter of fact, 
Levi, we'll get to that in a minute, but he's basically saying, Levi and Simeon, you're not going to have your own land like everybody else because of what you've done. What did they do, you say? Go to Genesis 34. So Simeon and Levi are the quintessential overprotective brothers, I mean, to say the least. So the story here, and we're not going to go through the whole story, but the story is, is that Simeon and Levi had a sister named Dinah, and she went out with the, the daughters of the land, the Bible says, and she went out and she was, you know, she was mixing with people she shouldn't have been mixing with. And she found this man, and you know, she was defiled by this man. So she was no longer pure. And you know, the man, I mean, there was not a, it was not a forceful situation. You know, many people will say um, that, but that's not what the Bible says. The man actually wants to marry her. He comes to uh, Jacob and his brothers and, and their brothers, uh, and Dinah's brothers, I'm sorry, and says, hey, you know, we want to we wanna be able to marry your daughters. We want to join with our tribes together, and they're trying to kind of make this peace. And so they say to them, they trick this whole city of, of Seshem, and they say, okay, if you go out and you're circumcised, then we will join with you. So all the men in this city go and they, they perform that as a, you know, adults. And the Bible says literally that you know, the second day or the third day when they were all you know, recovering from their surgery, that Simeon and Levi went and basically killed everybody. Talk about being overprotective brothers. This is what Jacob is talking about. So look at Genesis 34 and verse 24. The Bible says, And unto Hamor, and unto Shechem his son, hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised, and all that went out of the gate of his city. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, who? Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And that's not all they did. So they go there and they, they trick these men to go and have this painful procedure done and then just to kill them, just to kill everybody. Okay, and they slew everybody, and they slew Hamor and Seshem, his son, with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Seshem's house and went out. And the sons of Jacob come upon the slain, and they spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. So they took all their stuff, too. They took all their stuff. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and all that was in the field and all their wealth and their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. So because of this, I mean, this is an evil act that they did here. I mean, they, I mean, talk about, you're, you, I can understand being overprotective. I have two sisters myself, but come on, you know, I mean, these guys murdered all these people and then they stole everything in the city, basically. So Jacob basically lays a curse upon, you know, these two men because of their cruelty. I mean, this was definitely a cruel act that they did here. All right, so they will not have their own territory. Judah takes his land, Simeon settles inside Judah. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. We'll see what happened to Levi. All right, Levi. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, look at verse number 8. Levi was not to have their own territory either, the tribe of Levi. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, in verse number 8, the Bible reads, At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance. So he doesn't inherit land. The Bible says that Levi is to, you know, the tribe of Levi was to be the priest. The Levitical priesthood of the Old Testament was from the tribe of Levi. The Lord was his inheritance according as the Lord thy God promised him. So Simeon and Levi, I just wanted to point out, they did not have their own lands. Okay? Turn to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. All the other tribes had their own lands. They had their own lands. In Joshua chapter 14, verse number 2, the Bible explains this. It explains it many places, but this is a nice summary of the tribes and the land that they got. And I want to explain a couple things here. The Bible says, By lot was their inheritance as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. You say, what in the world? I thought there was 12 tribes. For Moses had given the inheritance of two tribes and an half tribe on the other side of Jordan, but unto the Levites he gave none inheritance among them. So we've already seen that. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, 
Therefore, they gave no part unto the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in, with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. So, we have 12 tribes in Israel, but the Bible says here only nine, you know, receive an inheritance. And the reason for that is because Joseph is broken into two tribes. So, we get 11 from there. And Simeon and Levi don't get a tribe. So, basically, you know, when you look at Joseph, Simeon, and Levi, that's why when you look at a map, of the 12 tribes of Israel from a historical standpoint. You'll have these half tribes, and you basically have 11, but then Manasseh is broken into two. Okay, so that gives you 12. So if you count the actual territories, you will, you will count 12, but really only nine were given, uh, you know, according to the original 12 tribes. That's why the Bible says nine. You know, many people will say, oh, you know, it's supposed to be 12, but it adds up perfectly when you have the half tribes, Manasseh was again broken into two tribes. One was on the east side and one was on the west side of the Jordan River. All right? So I just want to explain that historical aspect. Go to verse number four of Judges chapter one. Verse number four. Now we see an interesting uh, situation here. In verse number four of Judges chapter one, the Bible says, And Judah went up. So Judah's going to war, and he's going to war with Simeon. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. That means they won the battle. They won a great victory because of the Lord. And they slew of them in, Bez in Bezek 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, so he's the king, and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. I mean, what in the world? I mean, who could say that the Bible is boring, by the way? I mean, so here they catch this king. Turn to Exodus chapter 21. They catch this king, and they cut off his thumbs, and they cut off his big toes. I mean, doesn't that sound strange? Kids, that's weird, right? I mean, why would you cut off someone's thumbs and their big toes? Well, look at verse number 7, and we get the answer. You turn to Exodus chapter 21, and I'm going to read for you Judges chapter 1 and verse number 7. But this king... And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, that's seventy kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table as I have done. So God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Look at Exodus chapter 21. So this king had done this to seventy other kings. He, every king that he conquered, he cut off their thumbs and he cut off their big toes. Okay, look at Exodus chapter 21. So this is why the Israelites did it. Look at verse number 24. The Bible says this. It says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. He did this to others. It's proper punishment that it happens to him. Okay, so look, let's have an object lesson this evening. Okay, why in the world the thumbs and the big toes? So I want to get a volunteer here. Josiah, I need a volunteer, okay? So what I want to do is I want to just explain something. Why would you cut off someone's thumbs and big toes for a punishment, okay? So Josiah, here we're going to have, a, we're going to have an experiment, okay? Since everybody's over here, you back up a little bit there. Here's a, just a regular bottle of water. I just opened it, okay? I loosened the cap for you, okay? Now, what, are you left-handed or right-handed? Left-handed. Left-handed. So that's the hand you would like to use? Yeah. So we're going to tape that hand so you can't use it, okay? Raise up your other hand. This is a one-handed experiment, all right? All right, now, with one hand, how are you doing? Good. All right, with one hand, I want you to open that bottle of water and take a drink. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, don't drink the whole thing. That's pretty good. You did good. Let's put the cover back on just lightly. Now give me your hand for a minute. Hold your hand out like that. Let's take away your thumb. Put your thumb like that. Lay it down. Your hands up. Put just like that. There you go. We're going to take away your thumb, buddy. Hang on. We're going to make you thumbless. All right? How are you feeling? Now, 
I can, you can still wiggle it a little bit. All right. Are you feeling thumbless yet? Yes. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do, using that same hand, I'd like you to open that bottle of water and take a drink, if you would. No, one hand. What seems to be the problem? Okay, just take the cup. Here, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll help you. I'll hold it. There you go. One hand. One hand. No, I, I. Well, no, hey, hey. All right, how come you're not drinking? I can't. Huh? I can't. You can't? Because you lost the use of your thumb, right? Would life be good or bad if you didn't have thumbs? Bad. Bad, right? All right, you can go back to your seat. All right, thank you. <laughs> so we see that the thumb is pretty important in your life, right? So if you cut off someone's thumbs, uh, you know, things would be difficult, right? You basically couldn't do, look, you couldn't do anything. Oh, sorry. Sorry, buddy. You couldn't do any manual labor. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't even get yourself a drink of water if you didn't have thumbs. I mean, it would be, I mean, we're joking tonight, of course, but it actually would be pretty miserable living without thumbs. All right, now, what about the big toe? What's the deal with that? All right, now, we're not going to do an object lesson on this, but what's the point of your big toe? So let me ask you a question first of all, just some practicality. When you get a hole in your socks, where does it, what, what comes out first? Your big toe, right? You know what I'm talking about. Your big toe ends up sticking out of your socks. It's because your big toe is so valuable in your walking ability, your balance. I mean, think of this, right? You like, uh, you like, I like boats, I like being on the water and sailing and things like that. Look, your big toe is your rudder. It's your rudder. It, it defines your direction on where you go. All right. Now look, it's even better. It's even better than this because I didn't even know this. But here's the one thing that you know: if you walk and you lift up your big toe, what actually happens is the arch of your foot rises like that. Because when you go to step, your big toe automatically rises, and the arch of your foot comes together. So when your heel hits, it acts as a shock absorber for your whole body. Right? So when you think about it, your big toe comes up and you get this nice shock absorber of your arch of your foot. So the big toe is actually integral in actual walking, not just direction. Okay, now if you want to have a fun little experiment, you know, we did this last night at your house, duct tape all your toes together and try to walk around your house. And try to, you know, duct tape your toes together so your big toe can't lift up and try to run. It's dangerous, be careful. I mean, your legs won't even work right. It's the weirdest thing. Your legs are like flying around like this, all because your big toe can't move, all right? It messes up your balance. You can't change direction properly. Look, and, and I mean, it's just the perfect shock absorber and rudder for your body to keep your, the human body balanced and moving forward and in every direction. I mean, it's beautiful, but it's all be an accident, right? It's all an accident that just evolved over time and, you know, how did that happen, right? So look, the big toe is super important. If you didn't have a big toe, you couldn't even walk. So think about these kings that had this happen to them. This was actually a pretty severe torture. I mean, we're kind of having some fun with it, but it was actually a, probably a pretty severe torture. These guys couldn't walk. They couldn't do anything with their hands. It must have been a very miserable life for these guys. So this king, it actually happened to him, you know, an eye for an eye, a wound for a wound. This is what they did to the king. Okay, look at verse number eight. Verse number eight. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites and dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. The name of Hebron before was Kerjatharba, And they slew Shishai and Ahim, Ahimen and Talmai. And from then he went against the inhabitants of Debur, and the name of Debur before was Kerjath Sefer. And Caleb said, so here's Caleb again. Remember Caleb? We'll talk about him in a minute. He that smith, smitteth Kerjath Sefer and taken it, to him will I give Aksa my daughter to wife. 
And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger, younger brother, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. So Judah's doing very well here, and Caleb is doing very well here as well. They're winning these battles. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask her father a field, and she lighted off from her ass. And Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Of course, this is a smart lady. She's looking for watered land. Of course, these are all people that raise animals. And if you want valuable land, you need water on that land. Okay? And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of the palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath, and utterly destroyed it. So that means, that's an important phrase there. They utterly destroyed it, okay? Remember that, maybe underline it in your Bible. And the name of the city was called Hormah. Also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Escalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah. This is why Judah's just winning all the battles. Because the Bible says the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. So this is the first evidence here in verse number 19 that something is waning. Something is waning amongst the children of Israel, especially with Judah here. Look at verse 20. And then they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Do you remember Caleb? So Caleb was very unique in the fact that it was only him and Joshua that were allowed to be in the wilderness for the 40 years and be allowed to come into the promised land. Why is that? Why is that? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse number 35. Now, Caleb now is, is in his 80s. He's an older man. And the Bible says in verse 35 of Deuteronomy chapter 1, Surely there shall not be one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear unto your fathers. So what is this about? Joshua and Caleb were part of the spies that went into the promised land. So Moses sent in you know, 12 spies to spy out the promised land. And they came back. And every single spy, except for Joshua and Caleb, was afraid. And all they could say was, look at how the people, we were like grasshoppers to these people. They were huge, and they were just men of war, and they just, they got all the people whipped up into a frenzy that they would not be able to go across the Jordan and take the promised land, except Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua said, no. He's like, the Lord will fight for us. They kept their faith. They had their faith. And, it, and it's for this reason, in verse number 36, the Bible says that God said, save Caleb, the son of Jephnua, and he, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he had trotteth upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. So the Bible says, this is what's being fulfilled here, is this promise from God that Caleb and his children would have this land. Go back to Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1, look at verse number 21. We see a shift now from verse 20 to verse number 21. It's very clear that something has changed, that something is going on that is different from the first part of Judges chapter 1. And look at verse 21. The Bible says, And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites, that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. So look, here they chose not to drive them out. You see that they made the decision to not drive out the Jebusites. Verse 22, And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. The house of Joseph sent to, destroy, sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when they showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man go and all his family, the guy that helped them. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name therefore unto this day. 
Neither did Manasseh. Now we see it continue. So we had a little victory in there. Now we see this whole idea continue. It says, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshean and her towns, nor Tanak and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblium and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in the land. So the Canaanites, the, the heathen, stayed there. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute. That means, look, it, it doesn't say that they were too weak to overcome them. It says that they chose to put them to tribute. What does that mean? It, they chose to let them stay there, and they basically taxed them. This happens today. In many Middle Eastern countries, you know, people that aren't the religion of Islam are just, they're allowed to live there, but they're taxed. They're taxed at a heavy rate. So they basically, they put them to tribute instead of utterly driving them out. Look at verse 29. This continues. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahal, Nahalol, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. I mean, where does it say that they dwelt? It says that they dwelt together. They were dwelling in the same cities. It's not like they let them stay in this city and they built a city over here. They lived together. They lived in the same area. It's like all these different people living in one city. And the Bible says, Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Alab, nor of Aksib, or of Helba, nor of Aphek, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites. They dwelt among them and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. It doesn't say that they weren't strong enough to. It just says, it just says that they didn't. They chose not to. Don't miss this. Look at verse 33. Neither did Naphtali. Now we're just going through all the tribes here that just chose to not drive out the Canaanites. Neither did Naphtali, Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth, Bethanath, Nath, Bethanath, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. So not only are they living amongst them, but they're making money off of them. You know, do you think that maybe that had some kind of motivation for why they were doing what they were doing? And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down into the valley. So these guys are losing a battle, at least. But the Amorite, Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres and Algelon and Shalbim, yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. So once again, the coast of the Amorites was from the going up of Akrabim, from the rock and upward. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. You say, what's the big deal? Sounds fine. It sounds fine. The problem is, the big deal is, this is not what God wanted them to do. This was not the orders that they were under. They were actually supposed to do the opposite. And you say, well, that sounds cruel. Well, who are you to say what God should tell people to do? So I'm going to show you why in the Bible God gave these specific orders. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and look at verse number 3. This is the orders that the Lord gave to the children of Israel before they went into the promised land. They were very specific directions. Look at verse number three. Or go, look at verse number two. The Lord God, just go to verse number one. Let's read the, the whole thing. When the Lord God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Does it sound familiar? This is exactly what's going on, what God told them to do. Seven nations greater, greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. He's like, you are to wipe them out completely and utterly destroy them. He even brings it to detail of the animals they're supposed to wipe out. Everything. And make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Now look, first of all, you need to read the whole Bible if you think, oh, this isn't, this isn't fair, or this isn't right. These people have been defying the Lord, and as a matter of fact, when you know, the Bible was going to bring the children of Israel into this promised land, there's a time in the Bible where the Bible said, hey, you know, it, it's, 
It's not full. My wrath isn't full against these people in the promised land yet. Hundreds of years later is when this happens. God's wrath is upon these people. They have turned upon the Lord. And God is sending the children of Israel in there, and he says, hey, wipe them out, utterly destroy them. Neither, and look at verse number three. And God even, like, God, it's like God sees what's going to happen. Right? So he gives them, like, plan B, because he's like, it's almost like God knows, I know you're not going to listen to me. So in verse number three, he says, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. So let me ask you a question. If you go into a, a war against a nation and you utterly destroy the entire nation, do you have to give the order to not make marriages with them? They're all dead. You don't have to make marriages. So God knows that they're not going to listen to him. Okay? And he says, don't make marriages with them then. God's just trying to give them extra warnings. Hey, here's, here's plan A, you know, what you're supposed to do. But, you know, I know you're not going to listen to plan A, so here's plan B. At least don't marry them. He says, neither shall you make marriages unto them. Thy daughter shall thou, shall thou not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto his son. He's like, hey, don't intermingle with them. Don't live amongst them. He's like, because if you do live amongst them, what's going to happen? You're going to end up intermarrying. And not, I mean, have you ever seen two families where the children get married and the families have completely different cultures? What a disaster. You don't have to be saved to have seen that in your life. Okay, so God is just giving warning after warning after warning here in Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we see in Judges chapter 1 that they imme almost immediately after Joshua dies, they start turning away from what God told them to do. So that's the application I want to make this evening, is settling the land. Settling the land. Look, the actual battle that Israel fought can be compared to the spiritual battles that we fight today. It can be totally compared. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We are told, the, you say, oh, that's the Old Testament. No, but spiritually, we are told the exact same thing today. We are given the exact same instruction today as Christians, as saved people, that God gave the children of Israel. Look, God does not change. God does not change. There's not Old Testament meanie head God and then New Testament long-haired sheep Jesus. It's fake. God is the same throughout the whole Bible. And His direction to saved people, to Christians, to believers is the same. And I'll prove it to you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 14. First of all, the Bible says that we are to not collaborate with the heathen world. We are to have non-collaboration with the heathen world. The Bible calls it being unequally yoked with the heathen world. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't take my word for it. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. The Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So maybe this is telling you maybe you should think about, once you're saved, maybe you should think about, you know, believers and unbelievers and there being a divide there. You know, the Bible is saying don't be, un if, if, you're, if you're hanging out and you're collaborating and you're fellowshipping with unbelievers, it says you're unequally yoked. What does that mean? Well, it says, what commun communion hath, hath light with darkness? I mean, can, can those two exist together? Think about it. Think about it. Can the, can the light exist in the darkness? Here's what happens, and here's what the Bible teaches over and over, by the way. If you're a light, and you're trying to hang out in the pitch dark, you're going to get pitch dark. That's why this garbage teaching about how we need to send our kids to public school so they can be a light to the others. No, they're going to get dark is what's going to happen. The Bible teaches that again and again and again. Look, you young people, you young people, they, you know, you've come out of the dark or you're thinking about coming out of the dark. Look, I mean, you look around a church like this and you see, you know, you see us all like this, right? With our suits and our ties. Do you know that a lot of us have been in the dark? Do you know that a lot of us came out of the dark? But here's the thing. If you're a light and you want to come out of the dark, you got to get up and you got to walk out. You got to walk out of the dark. Because the Bible says that we are not to be yoked together. There is no, look, there is no place for you. 
in the dark if you're saved. There is no halfway. There is no one foot in. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Many people have tried before you. It doesn't work. Light and dark don't go together. It's very simple. And it's up to you. You have to get up and walk out of the dark. Look at verse 17. I mean, the Bible I mean, just continues in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, wherefore, come out from among them. It doesn't say, wherefore, you know, um, hope that you, you, you roll out, or wherefore, you know, hang out with them for a while, or wherefore, come halfway out. It says, come out. It's like something you have to do. Wherefore, come out from, an, uh, from among them and, and be just a little bit further away from them? No, it says, come out from among them and be ye separate. You have to be separate from them, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Look, this is the exact same direction that the children of Israel were given. We are given the same. That we are not to be among them. We're not to be unequally yoked. I mean, look, this also turns into, you know, be, being carefully, I mean, talk about being unequally yoked. If you're hanging out in the dark, you know, the Bible says, you know, be careful, just like in Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Bible says, be careful who you marry. The Bible says, be careful who you marry, because guess what? If you hang out in the dark, there's a chance you're going to get married to someone who's, who's, in, who's in the dark. Believers should not marry unbelievers. But, you know, once again, God in His mercy gives us direction on if that situation should happen. Gives us direction. We're not going to get into that. But I mean, God in just his, his infinite mercy towards us. I mean, it actually has biblical instructions on how to handle an unsaved spouse. But like everything else the Bible warns against, it's best to not go there. It's best to not end up in that situation. So look, we are not to have anything to do with the wickedness, with the darkness. And, and that's, like, that's the unbelieving world. I'm sorry, you should not be hanging out with unbelievers. You have to walk out of the darkness, folks. It, I mean, you're not the first one that's done it. You're not the first one that's, that's been in the darkness, that's had to walk out of the darkness, that's had to put up with, you know, craziness from walking out of the darkness, put up with the darkness wanting to keep you there. Because look, the darkness doesn't want to let you go either. The darkness doesn't want to let you go. You just got to go. You just got to go. And you can do it. I mean, the Lord, I mean, you're the light now. I mean, you have that, you have that ability. So why? I mean, why, why did Israel, I mean, why did God give all these warnings? You think about it, right? Turn to Joshua chapter 24. Turn to Joshua chapter 24. So God, I mean, this is not the first time that God is warning against this. It almost sounds, starts to sound like a broken record if you read the Old Testament on God just warning again and again and again about mixing with the people in the, you know, the heathens in the promised land. It's just over and over and over again. It's just warning after warning after warning. So you say, why? And then you read the Old Testament and you see what happened. Look at Joshua chapter 24 and verse number 31. This is the end of the book of Joshua. And look what the Bible says. The, the Bible kind of gives us the answer of what started to happen even before we get into Judges chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 24, look at verse number 31. The Bible says, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and the days of the elders that all overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. So he had Joshua, and then he died, but even the people that saw the works of Joshua, the leaders that were with Joshua, it says they served the Lord during Joshua's life, and then also during the life of these men that saw the works of Joshua, that died at some later point. So these were leaders that were leading with Joshua during the conquest, and they were probably younger than him, and they ended up dying later. So the Bible says that, you know, they served up until that point. <laughs> and, and then you start to see in Judges chapter 1 what starts to happen. I mean, what, is, what was that, about 1.5, maybe two generations? You know, a generation in the Bible is about 30 years. You say that was two gen maybe 60 years, and you sit there and you read the Bible, and you think, what are these guys, what are these people, a bunch of idiots? Are these people a bunch of fools? I mean, God, how many times does God have to warn them? I mean, the Israelites came into the land, they saw these, I mean, they, imagine the shock. They came into the land, they saw these heathens sacrificing their children. That's what these people did in these nations to false gods, living in these brutal, 
heathen societies. You read some history books about these heathen societies. I mean, they're just brutal societies to the point of disgusting societies. I mean, it must have been shocking for them. Yet they began to adopt their cultures within two generations, within 60 years. You say, what was wrong with them? What a, what, what a bunch of fools. They didn't listen to the Lord, right? Right? Ah, but look at us. Look at us. I'm just going to give you one example that's probably the most glaring example. From 1915, I mean, that's not that long ago. From 1915, that's 100 years ago, right? 1915 to 1991. 1991, I was in high school. You're like, whoa. But 1991, I was, high, I was in high school. I was a teenager. From 1915 to 1991, communism in the world is estimated to have killed over 100 million people. 100 million people. That's more than two entire states of California. I mean, murdered under uh, a philosophy. And yet, we are racing down that path in this country today. I mean, what, what is that like? One and a half generations? Maybe two generations? Look, less than 50 years ago, it was well known that this philosophy murdered millions of people. Does anyone even know that now? In the 80s, in the 80s when we were in school, if you didn't like your buddy, your buddy was making you mad or something, you called him a commie. So you commie. I'm serious. Don't call me a commie. You want to fight? Shut up, commie. I mean, that's what we did. I mean, it was a big deal. It was a known evil thing. It was a known evil thing. Communism today is infiltrating, infiltrating schools, churches, political movements. I mean, Business Insider had an article just a few months ago that said of the millennial generation, if you're under 30, you're a millennial. I'm sorry. The millennial generation, seven out of ten, would, would be happy with a socialist leader. That's real. I mean, that should scare the living daylights out of us. But look, all these social movements, look, let me just give you some warning here. All these, all these, these far left social movements that are going on today, at the core of these movements is communism, is Marxism. You say, what? Look into it. Look into it. From all these riots to this environmentalism, the base is all Marxism. All of it. It's this idea that capitalism needs to be destroyed in this country. I mean, they, I mean Christians should have nothing to do with these groups or these philosophies. All these young people are what Vladimir Lenin would call useful idiots. You say, what does that mean? It's an actual thing that was invented by some of the founders of communism. A term coined by Vladimir Lenin, look him up, as he created armies of soldiers around the world to subvert capitalism and democracies. So here's the useful idiot definition. See if this sounds familiar today. Someone who supports one side of an ideological debate, but who is manipulated and unaware of the ultimate agenda driving the ideology in which they describe. Meaning people think they're fighting for human rights but they're really pushing a bigger agenda, which is Marxism right. in the country. It's, it's crazy. Follow the origins. Look, if you're, you look at these groups, look at their leaders, and follow their origins, and look at their beliefs and where they came from. And you'll find a lot of words like Marxist, socialist, communist. That's the origin of all these far left groups. Look, it's evil, people. It's straight up evil. Right. It is evil. Karl Marx was the founder, Marxism is, Car is it's talking about Karl Marx. He's the founder of the communist form of government. He's the one that wrote the Communist Manifesto. Read that. Read that. He literally wrote it. Look, it's, a, it's basically, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a religion that murdered over 100 million people less than 100 years ago. 100 million people. And they don't even know. They don't even know, folks. When you start estimating things in the tens of millions, that means you have no idea how many people actually died. I mean, large percentages of nations cease to exist from this philosophy. And here's the irony of this socialism, by the way. I'm just going to go off on this just for a couple minutes. 
Here's the irony of it. It's covetous at its core. The socialist today will say, oh, capitalists are just greedy. The socialist, look, the philosophy will, I mean, this philosophy will literally murder you over stuff. That's what it was. They literally murdered people over material possessions. I mean, if you're a socialist, you have a greed problem. Period. I mean, seven out of these seven out of ten people, you know why they'll they they will vote or they want a socialist leader? It's because they want your stuff. It's because they want other people's stuff. That look, they decry success and they decry business because it's it's based on the love of money. That's what it is. First Timothy 6:10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Look, with socialism, it's an obsession with money. And look, capitalism is based on, look, socialism, socialism is the obsession of material goods. Capitalism is the necessity of freedom, is what that's based on. It, it's a necessity. It's a fall, and by the way, it's a fallacy that greed is a problem with only rich people. I mean, are there greedy rich people? Of course, but that's a fallacy. Uh, the lottery is a perfect example of this. You know that people under the poverty line buy four times more lottery tickets than people above the poverty line. It's greed. The casinos are full of people that can't afford to be there. It's greed. That's all it is. If you have no money and you go to a casino, it's because you're greedy. If you have no money and you're just spending all your money on lottery tickets, it's because you're greedy. Because you don't want to get your money God's way. That's the bottom line. Get your money God's way. So back to the Israelites. Back to the Israelites. They were told to have nothing to do with the inhabitants of the land, but they forgot quickly. And we're forgetting quickly today, too. And we are, it's not just social. That's just one large example. There's so many other things. But when you forget the law of the Lord, anything goes. And it doesn't, look, it doesn't take long. You think about what the, you, think about it, just think about what this country looked like 60 years ago. Think about what this country looked like 30 years ago. You know, talk to people that are older, and they'll tell you that, I mean, if things that were going on today were happening, you know, 30 years ago, people wouldn't have tolerated it. Not at all. We're also forgetting quickly, you look at the price now. When we go through Judges chapter 1, Judges chapter 2, Judges chapter 3, you look at the price that the Israelites paid, and that's the price that we're going to pay. You, just can, you can apply it directly to us because the exact same thing is going on. Our country is heading where these guys are heading in Judges chapter 1. So come out. Look, come out. What can I do, you say? Come out from among them. That's what you can do. Look, you don't have to be part of that. And especially, I mean, if you're here, you don't have to be part of that. Come out from among them. This is your oasis. I used to read uh, Superman comics. This is your fortress of solitude here. I mean, this is, you know, this is your foundation here. You have a sanctuary here. When all the mess out there is going on, when you come out from among them, you have a place to go. You have a place to go. Because look, this is not going to get better, in my opinion. We're going to do what we can. This is not going to get better. But when we study the book of Judges, just we're going to apply it a lot to what's going on today because it's the spiritual same thing that's happening. Judges, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.